Okay, so we should be seeing, yeah, this is Firefox, and I've got the site up over here. Um, okay, so I am logged out right now on this browser. So where's my mouse? Okay, here we go. Um, all right, so you can see we've got a nice, um, a nice view slideshow on the home screen, highlighting a few of the images in in the collection. Um, and we can go and browse like other collections in the in the um, on the site here. If we like click in. I'm going to show off a few things. I'm losing my mouse again. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm going to show off a few things. Let's take a look at. Let's close these tabs because I'm logged out over here. I'll show those things later. Um, let me show off some of the, the things we've got going on here. Like, when you have a really cool picture like this, like Harvey Firestone with Firestone tires, um, and you want to see, like, what is this? So you can click and then, like, really zoom in, see some real details of the photos that they've got up here. Um, and you've got all the metadata about, about the image down here that they have taken lots of care and time to put in. Um, let me show, they have a lot of images in their collection that are, have a lot of it, that have multiple images to them, and so they wanted those to be grouped together. Um, and we've got, which one is it? It is, one of these is a good one. So here's a, a World Series program book from 1947. It's got lots of pages to it, and they wanted to be able to have somebody browse through it. But one of the things that they didn't like, and actually I can pull that up if, if you want to see what we replaced this viewer with, I mean, or what we used this viewer for instead of what comes out of the box of Island, Island Door, they did not like the options that were, were given um, because it was, it was kind of clunky. And so we developed this pager thing instead so that you can just click through and, and look at some of the ads. <laughs> in the program book and you have the zoom functionality in here too so you can see what what was really going on back in 1947 um, and it's pretty slick it's it's nice looking people can browse through you can even browse through all the pages um, down here if you want to skip forward a bit this also has all the, the metadata down here so that's one of the, the, the cool things that we had to put together for them um, we also needed to do like say we wanted to save this to come back and look at later. Actually, I can explain this a little bit. It's it's one of the things that's on the their future roadmap is that they would like to um, they like people to purchase prints of some of the the things in their collections, and so they wanted a favorites functionality even for logged out users, where you could like save something to your favorites, and then hey, let's go back and do the other one too. Um, you save it to your favorites, and then for your session, while you're still here, you can like go over to your favorites and then take a look at what you've saved. And then part of our, I'll go into our future plans in a little bit, but this comes in handy even for anonymous users to have at least favorites for for a session. Like they don't necessarily want people logging in on their sites to make an account to keep favorites because that's a lot of overhead and a lot of stuff to manage, but. Um, I'll, I'll talk about what they're going to do with that a little bit later. Um, the other thing, oh yeah, let me switch over to being logged in because that's going to, I'll show off some of the behind the scenes stuff. And some of you might have some more questions about this behind the scenes stuff when I get get into it because this, this really kind of shows off some of what Islandor does. Did I fit everything? Yeah, okay. So, over the edit form, yeah. So, this is how you create um, metadata forms in Islandor. The the thing looks very Windowsy, but it's just just styling. Um, so over here we've got all of the mods mods fields that we wanted to capture. This was all worked out with the Troy Public Library about their particular 
metadata needs. We, the mod schema itself has hundreds of fields that you can use to, to, to describe your objects. And so they only wanted a subset of those, and so we had to work out with them based on their old collections and what they wanted to do in the future, which fields they were really gonna wanna use, and then we had to go in and put them into the schema as, as they need to be expressed in XML, because mods is, is expressed in XML. And so when you're building out the form, you have to conform to the way the XML is gonna look. And so you can see here, like in the name um, element, you've got sub-elements here for name, part, and role. So for example, um, and even under role, there's a role term. So this role element is a sub-element of name, and even within role, there's a sub-element of role term, which actually contains the value. So we had to, had to become experts at, at XML and XPath and everything to make sure that we could parse through this stuff in order to create it. And what it ends up doing is creating a very robust metadata schema that can be harvested by, um, by other repositories that kind of gather what digital repositories are out on the, on the web through these standards that libraries have, have developed. And they can build kind of indexes of what's out there in terms of digital collections. And so that's why it's important to, to follow these standards that have been, been developed. Um, and so yeah, we had to create the custom forms here with all these elements in them. And what they end up looking like is, well, we can just look at the, this is on the dev site, yeah, we'll just click save and preview. Um, so yeah, they look like a Drupal form when they're done. Um, so it's familiar and it's pretty easy to work with. Um, and they've got all of the info in here that they need to be able to use to create new objects in their repository through a Drupal form rather than through, um, through any kind of command line or any other difficult tools that normally you would, could work with with Fedora. So this is really the, one of the enhancements that Anandora brings to working with these kind of systems is that you can use Drupal conventions in, in building out your repositories. Um, another thing that they needed that we built, that we enhanced from Islandora was the workflow of their inactive items. Um, so they've got thousands of, of um, records that they haven't published yet because they're just, they have to make sure all the metadata is right, they have to make sure the images are scanned at the, the levels that they want them and everything like that. So they needed to be able to, to sort through their inactive items with their own identifier because the way that Islandora makes its identifiers is you can see when we're on a record like this one the, the Islandora identifier you can see in the URL the percent three a is really a colon but the identifier is with the namespace and then a number at the end and that's not the identifier that Detroit is used to working with because this is just generated when they get created or imported they needed the their workflow to relate to their internal identifier. So we had to, to tweak the simple workflow module that comes with Islandora, or that's available for Islandora, to display their resource identifier instead of the one that's out of the box, which was a bit of work, but it makes it so much easier for them to work with it because they really needed that to be able to see what was going on. Um, and the other thing, I don't know, actually, yeah, I can, can show this off. The batch import, that's why I opened this other thing. Well, let's just open it from here. So we had to develop a custom batch import for them because they had a legacy system of XML. Well, let's see. I don't really know how their old system worked. I, Hyperion is what it was called. Is that, do you remember? Yeah, okay. So Hyperion is the system they were using before. They were getting out of it, but they had available, they had all the images with file names named with their internal identifier, and they had XML files with all their metadata in a custom schema. Um, let me pull one up. Actually, that's the one that crashed. This one, here we go. Um, I'll pull up an example. Lost my mouse again, sorry. 
Okay. Um, they had their XML files like, like this. Can you see? So this is a custom um, schema that they had from their Hyperion system that we had to parse and then turn into the mod schema that we developed to be used with Alindora. And so it took a little bit of, of working, but we, we have this tool where we can take the XML and see how it's going to be parsed and turned into the mods that Islandora can ingest. And so we had this testing thing where we could test it after, after making our custom importer module that is partly XSL and partly some PHP parsing and see how it's going to actually convert it into mods XML. And so see, uh, let's pull that, pull that back up. You can see the difference a little bit if I put them next to each other. Um, so they have special fields here called like digit date and, and file form, which don't really map directly to anything named like that in, in mods. And so we ran some, 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 what would you call it, translations kind of on them and turned them into things like, uh, where's one? Yeah, so, the, so it's a, basically a note field for the file form and then like date captured is a digit date. So we had to do some transforms like that on this stuff. And this um, testing field right here allowed us to see as we were developing the importer how um, it, when we were getting on the right track of doing these transforms. And so it really helped as so when we knew our, our importer module was working because all of the metadata was coming out exactly as we expected it and it would be exactly what they wanted in the end. And then it would, it would populate all their displays properly like because then this, this form, the XML then powers the things like the metadata at the bottom of their records because this is spit out as, as mods fields. Um, let's see. I think, yeah, okay, so that's, that's some of the features. I can go over a few of the other customizations we had to do, but I wanted to stop right here and ask if anybody has questions about anything specific that you saw me show off or if there's anything else you want me to show off about what you might have glanced at. Um, I have a few other things I want to show off in terms of customizations that I can, like a little more in-depth of the code, if you'd like, or if you have questions, I'll, I'm happy to, to pause here and, and answer them. Anything that you want to show off that you think is cool that I skipped? Um, I think probably later just the views and narration. Okay, yeah, that, that's on one of my things to, to show off. Yeah? So how does it handle these like, big old TIFF files? I mean, those are pretty massive. Yeah, that's a good question. And, I, and one of the reasons I didn't really highlight it is because I, I don't know that we, we customize it a ton. So that's a good thing to explain about how Alandora works. So, let me open up one of these um, one of these objects that I'm, I'm logged. Where's my mouse again? Here we go. All right. So, because I'm logged in, I can go manage one of these objects. Actually, let me do this on on the dev site, just because I'm going to go into editing mode. Um, and forgive this one because it doesn't have. It's got a lot of test stuff in here. I am? Oh, thank you. All right. Yeah, so here we go, this one. OK. Um, let's open something up here. I think there's some stuff in this one. Yeah. So like, say we go into one of these objects. We can go to Manage when we're on one of these. And so this is what I was talking about with the data streams earlier on how Fedora works. This is actually a good demonstration of that. Um, so this is all the data, these are all the data streams that are attached to this particular digital object. We've got the, the rels X one, which is a system one that basically manages the relationships to any other objects. This is the mods XML that is populated by the form that gets filled out, or in this case, it was a batch import kind of thing. Um, the DC record is a system one that gets populated based on the mods form that we filled out. So what it's doing 
I don't know how many of you are familiar with Dublin Core and mods and whatnot. I might be going over a little of your heads right now if you're not familiar with the jargon. They're basically just different schemas. Mods allows for many different fields to be added, and Dublin Core or DC is a kind of a subset. There's only so many fields allowed, and so when you translate one to the other, you're kind of you're kind of dumbing down the granularity of mods to to fit it into DC fields, and so, but DC is built to be um, pretty agnostic so that you can exchange metadata with many other systems if you all dumb it down to the same standards. And so that, that's the idea behind it. So the system takes your mod data, it knows the mod schemas, and it, and it maps it to the DC fields that make the most sense. And so you have a record here of um, things here like subject and creator and, and description and format and all that sort of stuff that it's pulling from the mods record but it's, it's populating it based on that but you can't really edit the DC stream itself because it's system generated. You, I mean you can but you probably want to add your own DC stream if it's going to be customized. Okay. Let me get a drink of water. Um, and then you see the TIFF is set to be one of the data streams as the object. But there's also all of these JPEGs included. And so, <coughs> excuse me. And so, yeah, what's happening is that we ingest the TIFF, or at least a pointer to the TIFF, and then we do, we use, I think we're using image magic on the back end to do all the conversions. Is that right? Image yeah. Magic. Okay, and Drupal, yeah, so yeah, that's another thing we actually did customize is Island Door out of the box uses Image Magic and what, what's the other one? Kudo, Kuduku or something? Cockatoo? I don't even know what it's called. But it's these image manipulating things where you can feed it certain image formats and it'll spit out a bunch of different image formats for you. Um, so it takes the TIFF and then we're feeding that TIFF into Image Magic and then looking at what we've set as Drupal image styles like the different dimensions for, for the derivatives and getting out a bunch of different derivative data streams that we can use in different ways on the site because sometimes you want to display the full size one, sometimes you want to display a thumbnail or something like that. So we're creating the derivative data streams to be used so you don't have to load the TIFF all the time, which gets back to your original question, like how do you manage working with the TIFF? The TIFF really is there to generate the derivatives but then to be stored archivally as the master image. And when you use the zooming tool, is that just one? Is that just a large JPEG that, that's zooming? Yes, in because browsers can't read TIFFs and they're not compressed really. I mean, they're not compressed as efficiently as JPEG, um, or the and well, they're not lossless too. So um, it's just a larger JPEG that is not that when you're clicking on your you're viewing the large JPEG when the small one is really the, the one on display at first. So yeah, you're right, it's, it's two images overlaid each other. Um, let's see, any other questions? I can show some of the, um, the views integration that we had to do. Um, I should show it on the, the flagging thing. I think I did have that open, but maybe not here. Okay. Oh, I put it into my list of links. I put it into the bookmarks. Okay, so, whoops. All right, this works. So, we created, because this might sound a little bit, um, no, it's not that list of favorites. This might sound a little bit weird for you, who, for those of you who are very familiar with the way Drupal works, because out of the box, Islandora doesn't have anything like support for flags or, or working with the, the Islandora objects as if they were kind of entities and doing Drupal-y stuff to them. And so it comes with a module, or the module is available called Islandora Bookmark, but it's kind of, it's so independent from the rest of Drupal, you can't really do what you normally would expect some kind of bookmarking functionality to do. I don't even know what it actually does out of the box because you said don't ever turn it on. <laughs> and so what we had to do was figure out a way, because we wanted this favorites functionality that I showed. And of course we know how to do that with like flag, because it's, it's real simple, and like flag and views. But we needed to be able to 
flag this object that's on the door is kind of in a separate system. And so what Ashok did here is he developed a module that allows us to treat the Islandor object as an entity, or really, he made a module that he calls Islandor Entity Bridge. Um, and I think basically it just, it, it pulls over a subset of identifier data into a Drupal table, or into a table in the Drupal database that kind of acts as a join table between what Drupal can use as an ID for an entity and what the ID is in Islandora so that we know what we're talking about. And so, yeah, it's super handy. And, and we have some plans for expanding on what it does. So what we actually have to do here is, is we make a view of the type, say up here, yeah, of the type Islandora entity bridge object. And so then we can feed it, the, well, like, so what the, some of the things are in here is like, the PID is what the, the Islandora ID is, the persistent identifier. Um, and we tell it we want, so the X path, this is when we have to understand the XML that the, that those forms are using because we have to tell it, so in the mods record, the field identifier that has the attribute type of resource ID, that is the field that we want to match on to be able to get the record we're actually talking about. Um, and so then we can take all this and actually this one I'm using because that's in our display down here. Like the, we're displaying the record ID because that's their, their record ID they wanted to show up with the record. And the same thing with the image. You tell it um, which there, each um, data stream has a, a data stream identifier, like TN for thumbnail, OBJ for object, like you saw on that on that screen. Um, you tell it which data stream for the image that you want to use, and then and then you can just display that because it's it's hooking into like it has a URL where it can, where it can see the image at at that point. Um, and then we put the flag stuff on it. And so it's flaggable. It's basically you're exposing this object to Drupal to be able to be flagged, and then we can do it how you normally would create a, a favorites sort of thing. Is there anything else I should explain about how this is working? Um, yeah, because of how the bridge system works, it basically exposes the entire Drupal ecosystem. So that's why we can use rules or views or right. Or yeah, and so yeah, what Ashok is saying is like. Um, because of this kind of join table that the bridge, uh, the bridge module is doing, you can do all the Drupal-y stuff to these objects because you have access to them now. I, I think right now you do have to go through views to do it all, right? Yeah, and so, but that's that's still pretty good because views is very powerful. You can you can access a lot of stuff through views to be able to do things that you want to. Um, let me look at a few of my other things that I wanted to show off. Oh yeah, I do want to show some of the solar stuff because solar is the other component of what we had to do. Let's take a look at, let's do a search here. So some of the, they had some interesting uh, requirements for their search. So if we do a search for like Ty Cobb in their search results, at first, I don't know how many, how many of you are familiar with solar? And, and the kind of ways that it works. Okay, so only a couple of you. So what Solar is, is a, a search index that um, you can plug Drupal into and, it, uh, and you can plug a lot of systems into. It, it basically indexes all of your content in a way that you can do really robust searches on and, and, it's, and it's speedy. Um, but you do have to set up a lot of parameters if you want it to behave differently than it normally does. And so one of the examples is this particular search for Ty Cobb. We originally had it set up so that it wasn't going to index anything that was smaller than, that was three letters or smaller. It had to be four letters to get indexed. And so nobody could search for Ty Cobb because if you put a two letter thing in there, it was not gonna return, it would say there's no results because it, it sees that two letter thing, it's like that's not allowed. You can't search for something that small. Um, 
but this is like a, an important search for people to be able to do. But the other thing is that we also had to implement partial searching for them because, so I guess Detroit is a big automobile city, but people might come in and search for auto um, in the search box, but we want those results to return automobile, if that makes sense. And so with the partial searching on and the ability to search two-letter strings, you get back things for Ty Cobb, like party, because it ends in T-Y, and that, and that kind of thing. So it really gunks up your search results when you go down to the, the number of strings you can search, or the, the number of letters in a string that you allow to be indexed. And so we had to manipulate the way the results showed um, so that you can kind of see some of the remnants of it up here. Um, this is showing what the query is. Um, so we made it a couple different catch-all fields, which refers to, we take all the fields that we're searching through, kind of globbing them all together into a single field, so the index looks at it all as one big field, and then searches through that. We had to do two instances of that. One of them, we didn't do any of the partial searching on, and the other one, we did allow the partial searching on. So the first one, the ones to make the, the results show up at the top that say things like Ty Cobb with the two letter strings, we said only show those results that are exact matches to these strings. And then maybe, let's see, the one at the end. And then afterwards, also show the results of anything that's a partial match. So. Let's see, some of it, it's searching descriptions too, so that might be part of the reason why you can't see any, any, anything here in the titles. But, but yeah, this would be like, for example, if stuff with the word party was coming up, they'd show up at the end because the score wouldn't be high enough for both the exact match and the partial match. It wouldn't be high enough to bump them to the top. And so we had to do a, quite a bit of customization like that because they had some very... <coughs> specific requirements, especially searching around their resource IDs, because you can see the way those strings are kind of constructed with letters and numbers together. They wanted sort of exact matches on those, but also partial matches at the same time, because they didn't always want to use the letters, and it, it got kind of weird. So there was a lot of solar configuration that we had to do for it, and but I think we're getting them pretty much exactly what they want now. Um, just kind of a gotcha for you if you have people who really want to control their search. It can get kind of hairy. Um, let's see. Oops. Um, oh, yeah, the other thing to mention, I, I did do a, uh, a custom Omega 4 sub-theme for the site because we wanted to match their, their current Detroit Public Library site, which is actually a Drupal 6 site, and the Island Door site's a Drupal 7 site, but we had to... So I couldn't just use the theme, I had to make a new one, but I think I did a pretty good job at, at matching the style. Um, so if you have questions about how I did anything in, in Omega 4, I can answer that. Um, and then I think that's, that's a lot of what I wanted to go into. If anybody has questions about how I did anything in code, or anything about how Island Door works in general, um, I'm happy to open it up for questions or any other discussion about this. Uh, how, how much work went into this? Is this uh, like a three-year project, a uh, two-man-month project? Uh, six, uh, months, six months, would you say? Well, not full-time six months, but juggling other projects and, and whatnot, working with them, waiting on them kind of thing, six and months. That's six months of one person. Yeah. Oh, a team, person. a team. But also, but there was there was delays and wait, waiting time in there. Um, if, if we had been able to, say, dedicate two people to the project full-time and Detroit were able to be as responsive in order to make sure that that kept going full-time, this probably could have been done in two months. Yeah. And at the same time, this is, this was one of the first Island Door projects of this scale that we had worked on. And so there was some learning for us involved, which, which will make these projects faster in the future. And so there's always going to be learning for any team that's getting involved in this in a newer technology that they don't understand. So 
Who maintains our own door? I've asked Ashok this question. He might be the best one to answer this one. There, it's, it's a community project, I believe, but... Yeah, the company Discovery Garden, which is a spin-off of people, I think, that were working at University of Prince Edward Island, where Islandora was developed, turned it into a company to help support. But it is open source software. It's, it's, yeah. it's basically Drupal modules, and, and they do solicit community involvement in the project. <laughs> So it's not just one company behind it, but there's a company highly involved in it. If there's uh, there's the Islandor Foundation. Oh, okay. Uh, and that's what kind of yeah. that's a consortium of different people. Uh, some of them involved in the some of them are coming from Discovery Garden. Some of them are involved in the Fedora community. A couple of them are involved in other universities that use uh, Islandor as well. Yeah. Uh, but they help them. And the website for Islandora is islandora.ca, in case you're interested in looking at that. Anyone else? Yeah? It's, I'm curious about the, that blow up feature. Oh, the jQuery Zoom. OK, yeah, we can go into yeah, that a little bit. It, I think it, really. It seems off the track of. The, no, 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 so, no. Uh, Islandora, but it, it, to me, it's just such an amazing thing. No, it's a, it's. I'm, I'm curious how you do that's, that. That's that's why we picked it because we thought it was way cooler than the stuff that they were using for Zoom. You want to show um, the, the original? Thing? Yeah, I had that, that's. I had to restart my computer, and I don't have my VM up anymore. Actually, no, I have a bookmark. Hold on a second, I'll find it. Um, here's all my links. Uh. It's this one, yeah? yeah. Open Sea Dragon? Okay. Yeah, we didn't like that. But you might be able to see why. Well, see, I went in the box and started scrolling and it started wobbling around. I mean, it works like maps and stuff work, scroll in and out. Um, uh, but it's just kind of, I think it's kind of clunky because, like, if you don't, if you're not familiar with scrolling and you go and you tap, you can zoom in, but then you can't zoom out unless you go click. And I don't know. We thought this one was kind of clunky, but the zoom, the jQuery zoom one is, is I yeah. think it, zooming it on the maps always drives me crazy. Actually. Right? Is it is it up or down or is it? Yeah. I don't remember. Like that kind of thing. But this is pretty neat because you can just you click in and then you move around. You have to click and hold. So I'm I'm holding my click right now, uh -huh. but you can still wiggle around the whole image, and and look at it pretty cool. So it, like like I said earlier, it is, it's two images overlaid over one another, but it's it's a standard jQuery plugin thing, right? Like, yeah. Um, the person that built the jQuery Zoom library also did the Colorbox library, so uh, yeah, he's a uh, really good job. This guy? Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, like in our case, we made a decision to oh, okay. have it as a click. Yeah. As opposed to the yeah, this one's not a click. This is just a hover. So. Or you can also make it where you click it and then you can zoom around. Oh, you can uh, turn it on, click on, and then wiggle yeah. around and then click off. Okay. Yeah, so that was just, we found that one, thought it was better, and we rewrote it so that we were using that instead. Thank you for that. Yeah. Any other, any other questions about anything we did? Yeah. It might be worth mentioning why mods is so important. Yeah, um, let me pull up the site because I don't have a good blurb, but they might have a. Is this one? Yeah, here we go. Um, so, what MODS is, it stands for Metadata Object Description Schema. And it's been developed over many years by the library community to be a standard metadata schema to describe digital objects. Um, it has hundreds of fields, like I mentioned. Um, where did they go? So here's the elements. And you can, the, the reason it's important for people to standardize on schemas is so that you can move in between systems with the same metadata and you can um, exchange data with different institutions, between institutions, using the same standards. And you know, and it also makes it so that you really know how an object is being described when you're using when you're using the same fields and they mean the same things. 
Um, so this is an example. These are the top-level elements. Um, but some of them have a lot of sub-elements under them. So for example, like title info contains title, but also subtitle, part number, part name, non-sort. It's like a lot of things that you use for just like really granularly describing the parts of the metadata that you're talking about. Is that, is that kind of what you were wondering about? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have a lot more to show, but we've got 10, 10 minutes left. Uh, so who specifically is kind of standardized on the mods? Is it just libraries or is it more? For the most part, because I think libraries and, well, mostly libraries, because archival institutions sort of have their own, own other schemas. But because it can, you can take MARP data, which is library data, um, how you describe your like books and everything like that, it can be mapped into mods relatively easily, and mods is expressed in XML. It's, it's a good way of having harvestable metadata. And so that's why it's, it's pretty standardized around. And, and because it's very specific. For a while, I think the library community tried to standardize on Dublin Core, but it's just not specific enough. You lose a lot of the, the richness of your metadata if you're, if you're dumbing it down to 15 fields. So, anybody else? Okay, well actually, let me, let me go find my slides again. I can put my contact info up. All right. And, oh yeah, actually, let me talk about this real quick. Forgot about this. Okay, so some of the things that they want, they want to do on Detroit that I didn't go into. The ordering prints of images I mentioned briefly, that's where I think the, the favoriting thing is going to come into come in. Um, because if, even if they're not logged in, somebody can save favorites for a session and then go to an order form. We'll be able to use those favorites somehow to submit it as a form. Like, okay, I want to, I want to buy prints of these, here's the list of stuff I like. And so we'll be able to use that in that way. Another thing that they've talked about wanting is a way to do kind of featured images. So we're kind of want, going to want to use something probably with flagging again to let them as administrators flag stuff to highlight on their site. And we might use it in a certain way like that to make exhibits. We don't exactly know what they want. They just said they want exhibits. And we're like, hmm, what do you mean? Um, so we'll develop something like that, but using something like the Island or Entity Bridge where we can use the Drupal stuff where we're familiar and, and work with the Island or objects that aren't typical entities and pull them in and, and make like interesting displays with that, I think is going to be, be really powerful. So that, that's what we're planning on helping them with with the site in the future. And with that, I, I'll say thank you. This is my contact info if you have any more questions. Oh yeah, and the other thing, I think they're mostly done by now, but also other Cherry Hill presenters, I think Ashok has one more presentation after, right after this, move into Drupal with Migrate. So if you're interested in migrations, he's the man. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Oh, come on. All right, so now... Yeah, sure. Let me uh, stop this recording.